Humorous speech contestant number one, Henry James. Life lesson, life lesson, Henry James. Life has taught us a lot of lessons, but whether we learn from them is totally a different story. Here comes this year, fellow semester. Today, I want to share with you some of my life's lessons. The first one started in summer of 2011, when we were buying our dream house, which the loan from the bank was rejected due to credit problem. I was so surprised. No, never, I never owed anything to credit card. I always paid my online, on time. Well, I knew exactly what happened to me. Two years prior to that, I did the day theft happened to me. It took me so much time to take care of all of the merchants, so I didn't have to pay anything. I was not responsible. But I was pushing off 
again and again of calling all of the credit agency to make sure they don't have anything against me. I pushed off so many times I totally forgot it until two years later they remind me. <laughs> too late. We lost the deal. And my daughter asked me, Daddy, when are we going to move in? I love the sky window so much. And you told me I can take a shower at any moment under sunshine, almost like I'm on my beach. Honey, <laughs> you know, I don't think it's a good idea. You don't feel a sense of privacy. One day, I want to feed the ducks in the pond. Well, ducks, forget them. They crack, crack all the time. You cannot sleep. What, daddy? Ducks only crack during the day. They sleep during the night also. Well, well, I tried everything possible to cover them. My fault, but could I? I knew it was because of my bad habit. Procrastination. <laughs> could I learn the lesson? Well, you will learn from the next story. <laughs> <laughs> this past summer, we went a trip to the East Coast in our van. And I was so busy. I pushed off again and again of the plane. Imagine such a long line, so many cities. Until the last night before we started off. And I crafted out of something so called plane. And the second day in the morning, we punched in to address for the first stop. Niagara Fall. And happily we went. And but during the middle of the forest, Canadian border? How could it so quick to be Canadian border? We found a while we winded up Michigan, near uh, Detroit. <laughs> oh, according to GPS, that's the nearest the path. And I didn't check before I left. And the thing was, my brother's family visited us from abroad. They need to get visa to enter Canada. No way! It's at least a few days. Well, no choice except going back from the north side of the lake here down to the south side to our plan back through Ohio. In a hurry, we, I told my wife, we didn't have time to go to the park anyway, the Niagara Fall. Let's go to the hotel in Buffalo, Sheridan. But where's my address, honey? Well, honey, I don't have it, but punch in Buffalo. And there's only one Sheridan. When we get there, we know where they are. We can find it. Just punch in Buffalo. Okay, okay, Buffalo. We went. Finally, we got it. My wife said, honey, such a small town, it's so tiny. I don't think it's Buffalo. And let me remind you, the last recession helped the downside a lot. <laughs> we circled around, around so many times, we couldn't see any sign to share it. Finally, we arrived at a gas station. Sir, we're looking for Sheridan in the They looked at us, his jaw dropped, as if we were from Mars. We never heard of any Sheridan here. We only have one motel in this tiny town, and that is Dunkin' Inn. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, we, 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 we don't have time. I know you are, you know, we are not joking, okay? We have a, a night in the hotel and we will go to Niagara Falls tomorrow. Ha <laughs> ha, Niagara Falls! I know why. That is it, Buffalo, New York, and we are Buffalo, Southern Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> More than 300 miles away from each other. <laughs> oh, good, good, let's go, let's go, let's go. We punched in again, this time, New York. When we arrived at the hotel, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. The receptionist looked at us. Sir, you check out so early. <laughs> Excuse me, can I call them? Please check in. My wife was so mad. She was saying, hey, man, enough, enough. You told me you were going to plan it, but you, you did you did it. <laughs> and you lost the deal of the house, and we, we lost a lot of the time. Could you get rid of this bad habit? It was so emotional. <laughs> honey, honey, come on. I 
I know you are. Man, I, I know you have 10,000 reasons to do that. And it's kind of hard for me to get rid of the bad habit. But if you don't like it, I'm going to start a new habit easier. Why not? And it's positive thinking. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Timer. Humorous speech contestant number two, John Labby. John Labby. Dangerous question. Ha, 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 ha. 
bit later after that, I had a headache. Click. I hit the button. Soon I felt a hangnail. Click. I hit the <laughs> Later that night, two gorgeous young women entered my room dressed as nurses. <laughs>
please have a minute of silence for judges to mark their ballots. Thank you, Madam Timer. Contestant number three, Sue Wood. What's in a name? What's in a name? Contestant number three, Sue Wood.
to name the boy? Barnabas. Barnabas! <laughs> what would we call this child for short? Bar? Bus? Barney? This was at a time when a certain large purple <laughs> was very popular, and his name was Barney. The only other Barney that came to my mind was the nervous and up deputy sheriff character on the old Danny Griffith show, Barney Fife. <laughs> I don't know where my husband got his name, Barnabas. It wasn't an old family name or anything of that kind. When I told my parents about the proposed name, they were aghast. Two days went by. There was no resolution. I could tell that the hospital staff was beginning to think that the new parents really should have been able to handle this issue by now. They needed the information in order to complete the birth certificate. Ultimately, I decided to attempt negotiation. If I let him name the girl, would he permit me to name the boy? He was somewhat receptive to this suggestion, but he still wanted to maintain veto power over the ultimate selection. <coughs> I quickly drew up a short list of what I considered to be mainstream boys' names. One of the names on the list was Jeffrey. And he considered that to be acceptable, provided that we spell it the English way, which is with a G instead of a J. So the boy became Jeffrey. Spelled G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. And of course he named the girl Amanda which in any event was one of the more popular girls' names that year. As it turns out, the boy didn't grow up in Hong Kong or in England. When the twins were still quite young, we moved to Arlington Heights, and so they were raised as Americans. Consequently, the name solution wasn't entirely perfect. That's because the boy's name was frequently mispronounced. He's been called Goff and Geoff, for example, or Joffrey, like the ballet. <laughs> However, he wasn't compared to a large purple dinosaur <laughs> or to a nervous, inept deputy sheriff. Well, they're all grown up now, and <laughs> I'm relieved. I feel that by my willingness to compromise, and to allow my husband to name our daughter after his high school girlfriend, that I saved my son from years of schoolyard taunts and ridicule, and possibly from a lifetime of smirks whenever he said his name. Uh oh, I hope nobody out there is named Barnabas. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Timer. Our next 
speech contestant, Joan Walton. Love, cyberspace, and an SWF. Love, cyberspace, and an SWF, Joan Walton. Hit the high 
behind my purse. Fortunately, the guy went right in without looking my way. The guy came right back out. He was on a mission. And it wasn't me. He was carrying a pizza box. He got right in the truck and drove away. My friend Tom was still out there. Pretty soon, in pulled this zippy little convertible. And the guy who got out did look like the one that I was expecting. We had a good time. Easy, fun conversation. We decided to get together again. He said he would call. It's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that phone call. I would bet he's been taking care of his elderly mother and hasn't had a moment. <laughs> or maybe, maybe the dog gave that little piece of paper where I wrote my phone number. <laughs> Whatever. Tom, it's your loss. I decided to take this epic SWF off that digital shelf for a while. I long for the olden days where you catch someone's eye, they give you a smile and say hello. They might ask you out. They pick you up at your house, open the car door for you. They might bring flowers or a bottle of wine. I'm leaving all those virtual winks and hugs for the younger generation. And I'm moving on. Oh, wait a minute. I think my phone's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Timer. Our next speech contestant, Daniel Extra. Rebel with a Cause, the mostly true saga of a reluctant refugee from a war-torn womb. Rebel with a Cause, the mostly true saga of a reluctant refugee from a war-torn womb. Daniel Extra.
every time I've ever given this speech, and it's probably been a thousand times, and there's probably been 10,000 people who've heard this speech, maybe more, I ask this question, have you been a breach of birth? Most people don't know what I'm talking about, which tells me that no, you haven't. Which also tells me that I was the first breach of birth in the history of the world. And here's what happens. You all follow authority really well. When somebody says, do something, you do it. So when the doctor said, okay, Rhonda, be born, you got into a position like this, and you go out and you were born. And everybody was happy and they're smiling and they're all congratulating each other on what a good job everybody has done. And the doctor moves in the next room and makes about nine thousand more dollars. Now me, I was happy. I didn't want to come out. So here's what happened. We went into the hospital. I didn't know what a hospital was, but it was a big place with beds. And the doctor, I, the same guy, the same voice, I didn't know who it was, he says, Okay, Jean, are you ready? She says, yeah, I'm ready. He says, well, good. Let's go. Lay down here. She gets down on the table, and he says, okay, Jean, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say, breathe and push. <laughs> you breathe <laughs> and you push. <laughs> and I'm listening to all of this, and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Because he can't. 
can't tell my butt from my face. <laughs> it's true. I didn't just breathe, I screamed. So, time goes on, and he's just, they're cleaning me up a little bit. A little while later, there's a little lull in the action. And I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And all of a sudden, that same nurse comes back in. And she's holding a switchblade or a machete or something. What's going on here? She looks at me and she's bleeding in her eyes. She goes, it's time. I said, for what? Oh, oh my God. That was my circumcision. I never wanted to leave my comfort zone again. Thank you. We can have one minute of silence <laughs> while the judges mark their ballots. I know it's hard. One minute. Thank you, Madam Timer. Our final contestant, Pete Russell. Stupid is as stupid does. <laughs> stupid is as stupid does. Pete Russell.
Now look at it. It's Officer Piotrowski. And after his name, T dot, O dot. I know what that means. Training officer, I got a chance. The wheels are turning. The heart is racing. The adrenaline is pumping. I got to come up with something. So I started easy. So Officer Piotrowski, you've been on the force for some time. Oh, about 30 plus years. You know, officer, bam, it comes to me. I remember as a child driving with my dad on Lake Shore Drive. And he got pulled over for speeding once. As a matter of fact, the cop came to the car. And I remember this vividly. He had a red pencil, a blue pencil, and a green pencil. And they all said, widows and orphans fund. And if my dad didn't want to get a ticket, he had to buy a pencil and make a contribution. My dad bought a pencil so he didn't want to go to court. It was a $20 red pencil. We were pulling away, my dad looked at me and said, son, take care of that pencil. It's the most expensive red pencil I ever purchased. To this day, he still has it. Sure. To the fame of the Chicago Police Department. I explained this story. to Officer Pete Trust. I understand you don't have the pencils anymore. I understand we have Monty Hall, let's make a deal. He starts to laugh. He goes, I've never heard of this. You don't have to explain it to me. And I said, well, I get it. Door number one, I'm a nice guy. Roll the stop sign. Throw the keys in the car, lock them up, take the bus home. <laughs> Option number two, throw the keys in the car, lock them up, you write me a ticket for rolling the stop sign. Option number three, I'm a jerk and I'm going to the pokey for the night and getting my two. <laughs> Officer Pete Trusky looks at me and says, What do you think you deserve, Mr. Russell? Door number one, I'm a great guy. I'm the Prince of Lincoln Park. <laughs> All right, Mr. Russell. Throw back your keys in the car. You're free to go. Now the young female officer that was to kill on his ass, she was going to get her first duty and her first big bust. And it evaporated before her eyes. And I came up with this story before I was a toastmaster. I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's advance the tape. I want to go exactly one week to the hour. I'm driving home from Lincoln Park. <laughs> I come to Southport Avenue. I don't think wiser to stop sign before a red light. No, I'm a mathematician. What are the odds there's a Chicago cop waiting at this corner two weeks in a row at 2.15 in the morning? Everybody knows lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. <laughs> Well, I forgot to factor in the Chicago Police Department. It does strike twice in the same place. <laughs> As I rolled through that stop sign, I was like, oh, God, I can't believe I'm that stupid. Oh! And I look over. There's the same spot I hit last week. <laughs> Somebody trying to tell me something? I pull right over, they get behind me. Up comes the officer. I was hoping for an officer on Spinoza to get a second chance for a day. <laughs> Not my luck. I got the Tasmanian dollar. Handed my driver's license. <laughs> officer walked away. Both cops I lived in the car. The other officer goes to the truck. Starting to get the DUI stuff. And I'm just like, Officer O'Malley. Thinking this is good. Once again, it's just T.O. I'm on a roll. I go through the story. I'm halfway through the story. O'Malley's got his hand up. His hand's on his He's laughing. He goes like this. So I got through the whole thing. I said, Officer O'Malley. Door number one, door number two, number three. He says, what do you think here? I think door number one. He's laughing so hard. He goes, all right, Mr. Russell, lock the keys in the car. Close the door, I'm ready to go. I'm off. Two weeks in a row, stupid is it, stupid does it, can't be that lucky. Well, the officers are writing up their report. Officer O'Malley looks at me. You know that kind of thing. Yes, Officer O'Malley. You know, we talk in the locker room after shift. You don't think we tell the stories? So we never believed half of Trotsky's lies, but now we have to reevaluate all the stories he told us. My three takeaways that night were one, stop drinking at midnight and drink soda pop. I did. Two, the lady seemed to like it. That was a bonus. Number three, to this day, Never take Fullerton home from Lincoln Park towards the Kennedy Expressway for any reason.
Westminster, we have all built. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you remember the drill after the evaluation contest. Deep breath. Uh, contest is over, we get to relax, and get to have a little bit of fun. Now, I don't know about you, but for some reason during those moments of silence, I feel like I'm on jeopardy and the music is broken. So thank you all for dealing with that. If we can please welcome up our evaluation.
focus his attention towards like you know group of people. So I thought that would really make the audience feel more connected. So that's why it prompted me to say the word love. Okay. Now, is, have you spoken about that? Like, is that something you try to bring to your speeches? I try to, but I don't have a lot of experience speaking to a large audience. But when I speak in my talk, club, a corporate club, I try to speak to every every person in the audience. Wow. Yeah. But um, we are a small group, so I think that is something new. Okay. Now, I'm interested, you're an engineering major by it looks like a way of school. Engineering majors, I, I don't usually see them in front of a group of people. So this is it. My title is engineering manager. Or man, forgive me. But I mean, still, like, yes. engineers aren't a, a group that I want to join a contest. That's not normal. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more. Right. So what happened is, uh, Tina is sitting there, so I see her smiling. So basically, we didn't have a contest at our club. Uh, I got nominated to go to the area contest. And I won there. So that's how I ended up coming here. So I did not have to go to two contests, just one. OK. Well, on behalf of the Northwest Division, thank you for competing today.
um, uh, Rickflex. And she kept hugging me, and I finally said, okay, I'll go, just to shut up. And it's really, uh, it's great, you can work at your own pace, and uh, the main thing is you try not to hurt yourself. I've only got hit a few times, but it's, it's a lot of fun, it's great exercise, so I encourage everybody to try that. And it, it looks like you may take hits in another area of your life, because you're also an entrepreneur. That's right. Yep, I uh, started my own business about uh, five years ago. So um, it's Green CPA if you need any accounting or tax work. Talk to me. And you know, it's been a challenge with the economy, but I think it's great to be your own boss. It's, it's much better than being cubicized and like trying to, you know, corporate world as, as Jerry. I, I'd much rather be my own boss. Well, and the final thing, you've competed now. What advice would you give to the future contestants out here? <coughs> I think it's great. Definitely try it out. It's it's a, a challenge. It's exciting. It's it's a great way to grow as a speaker, and I really enjoy it. All right, Glenn. Thank you.
Yep, in the order that you spoke, so we're testing your memory a little bit. Yeah. All right, you guys know the drill? Name, club, and current designation of Toastmaster. I mean, yeah. uh, Toastmaster Club, Excel, Toastmaster Space, number one. Yeah. 3895. I'm also in Toastmaster um, Herbert with Jerry and maybe some other help. Next to the whole so I'm curious, now you, you sound like you've mastered GPS. Have you, have you, did you use GPS to get here today? Because I, I realize the directions might have been a little bit confusing. This is out in the middle of nowhere for some city folk and for those of us that aren't familiar with the area. I don't have any sense of direction. People don't me. I've been living in Hoffman for 70 years. I stay in the GPS system. Fair enough. You like to have it. I always trust. But now, I'm kind of it's interesting. I, I'm curious about your perspective because I remember a few years ago that I saw you as a target speaker in a contest. Oh, yes, or I don't remember which division, yes. I, I think it was either North or Northeast, but what was the difference between being a target speaker and then being an evaluation contestant as well as a congress contestant? <coughs> With that, I can experience every aspect of a, a contest from uh, being a speaker, a target speaker, and then when I sit there and evaluate the speaker, I know what evaluator they're looking for. I can improve my own speech in the future. And for humorous speech, of course, life, we all like humorous, like a lubricant for a machine. It can help you to run a machine smoothly. Well, great. Well, on that note, I'd like to present you with the certificate of participation. Thank you for participating. I'm John Labby. I represent Postmasters Plus Club 5677. And about a year ago, I reached final DTM. So you mentioned drugs. You mentioned... <laughs> uh, and then there's this interesting story about your wife. <laughs> Could you tell me a little bit about how you talked her into marrying you? Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, I also see that you're into golf and woodworking. Yes. Have you ever made your own golf balls? That would be stupid. <laughs>
everybody, I'm Joan Walton. I am a member of Crystal Light Toast Masters 2724. I'm a competent communicator, sober, and a competent leader. When you say those, it, I mean, that really kind of puts it out there. It's a little challenge for you. So I've got to be I, from what I saw up here today, you were definitely confident. I was, I was very impressed. And in addition to that, it, one of the notable accomplishments is making a difference in a child's life. And could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. I am a professional educator and have actually been in the classroom for 29 years. And I I feel that it has been such a gift for me to be, to be able to do that. I'm still doing it as a substitute teacher. And I, um, just this past week, I, I was in a classroom with a, a fourth grader, and he was taking a test, and he couldn't use his multiplication table chart. And uh, he was really frustrated. And so I just kind of said, well, you know, another way to do that is, is by adding this and this. Anyway, he said, thank you. <laughs> it's those moments that are just, just stay with you forever. So now I'm, I'm curious. I've done a little bit of online dating, and I've got the SF part down, but I'm missing the wealthy part. <laughs> and I didn't know if you were single or if you could at least coach me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want me to coach you. <laughs>
am IALB. I'm a chartered member of my club. And what I thought I should do after listening to a fellow Toastmaster was we worked together and said, Pete, you got all the energy, you got all the enthusiasm, but man, when you give a sales presentation, you're like a rabbit. You're all over the place. So I decided to become a Toastmaster to hold my skills and presentation skills to be a more effective salesman. Cool. Uh, now, so I'm interested. Uh, Prince of Lincoln Farts? Was there a queen? Was there a king? Oh, no. I was a self proclaimed <laughs> I didn't wait in lines. I didn't pay cover charges. I knew people. Didn't know people that night. I got stopped. <laughs> but I used to know people. We had a table at Gibson without having to wait. So no reservations. Same yeah. with Tavern on Ross. Same with Carmen. I used to know people. Now I moved out to the circus. I don't know anybody. <laughs> My goal, believe it or not, one of the other reasons I joined Toastmasters, is I have an enthusiasm for food and cooking. Most of you know that. And I really like to be an announcer on one of those shows and talk about some product that you can use besides not cold peels, roast matic, to cook or prepare food. I think I would be very good at it. Very cool. Well, I'm sure if you can pull off the Prince of Lincoln Park, TBC and HSN. Hopefully not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have taken your attention for long enough this afternoon. I'd like to welcome up Tiffany Salenko Howard, and we will move on to the program.
Yeah. I love that we have our contest last because I feel like we saved the best for last. So that's why the Northwest ended this contest season. Anywho, kind of boast us a little bit.